and the Earth is curved. So how do we go from a curved surface to a one-dimensional unit of measurement? And we do that with these projected coordinate reference systems. Okay, usually they're in units or meters, feet, inches. We like to use meters if we can, unless you're in an obscure United States government institution, uh, or maybe even British as well, that for some reason like to hold on to very strange measurements of units. Uh -huh. So we have to go from this three-dimensional to this two-dimensional. So how do we do that? So the geographic is really good for displaying and storing data in large, that covers large areas. This is why we use it to describe places on the Earth. You can give latitude and longitude, and you can immediately figure out where it is anywhere on the Earth. But if I say the coordinates are 500 meters west and 500 meters north, what does that mean to you? Very little. Where's the point of, where's the baseline? So this is why we have to come up with these special reference systems to give this type of information. So the geographic is really good for displaying and storing this data, but it's really bad for calculating geometries like area and distance because it's on a three dimension, it's a, it's a curved surface. So when you give a distance, it's not going to account for the curve. It's going to go straight through. And that's not actually the true distance. If you're, if you're bypassing the curve, you're missing a lot of the distance from point A to point B. So we have to translate that curved surface into a two-dimensional surface. And so that's why we use these projected coordinate reference systems. These are good for calculating geometries, but they're bad for displaying and storing location data at a large scale. Because again, you can't take a two-dimensional surface and put it in a three-dimensional surface without changing either some aspect of the geometry. So there's three typical ways that we do this. And by the way, I should remind you guys that this is very theoretical and this is primarily going to concern you if you're really interested in doing geographical information systems. Okay, so luckily we have software that helps us navigate all of this. And you guys don't have to make a lot of these calculations. But it is really important to understand where these coordinate reference systems are coming from. Okay, and understand when they're good to use and when they're bad to use. Okay, so I don't want you to feel overwhelmed that you don't know how to use a cylindrical surface transformation to display your data. You don't need to do that because the computer will do it for you. But it is really important that you understand why they're doing that and when it's good to use a cylindrical, a conical, or a flat projection. Okay? So the, the way to envision these is to picture the Earth at the center. And what you get is if you kind of unroll this surface. So this is a cylindrical. And what you would get, sorry, this is flipped. So this is here. Right, this is a cylindrical. This is a conical. And you would get something like this. And this is uh, the azimuthal, or the plane. Okay, each one of them can be used for different purposes, depending on the, the question that you have. And each one of them distorts the actual geometry in a different way. So the cylindrical, this is the Mercator. If, if you guys know the Mercator, this is probably one of the most common projections that we use, the Mercator projection. Okay, these are different examples. This is probably one of the most common. What is something that we recognize about this representation of the Earth? The thing that most jumps out to you. And just a reminder, everybody, that we will have these slides for you um, after the uh, presentation, after the day. We'll have all of the lecture slides for everybody available. So don't worry. I mean, you're welcome to take photos of it, but don't worry about doing so because you will have access to these materials. 
So what jumps out most to me is this. Antarctica is massive. It's like the largest continent. It spans the entire map. Okay, it makes it look a lot bigger than it actually is. And so the Mercator does that typically in the, in the poles because it's, un, it's unwrapping the poles and stretching them to try to put them on this flat surface. Okay, there's different ways that we do this depending upon where we put the center point. But again, usually we're not focused on Antarctica. Nobody is, not very many people are studying Antarctica. So it usually is the most distorted in a lot of these map projections. Conical. These are really good if you want to calculate distance along a certain parallel because it preserves those distances. Okay, but it will change the areas or it will change the shapes. So if you're really interested in calculating distances over large areas of the globe, then you could consider a conical projection. And probably one of my favorite because really a lot of times what I'm doing is calculating areas is using these azimuthal plane projections. And you can center these anywhere on the earth and you can get an equal area around the center, but only around the center, okay? Other areas get distorted. So, these are just the three examples of, of how we make these different projections, okay? You can see here, this is Africa, and you can see the shape is totally distorted. We can't see half of it. But here, everything is preserved more or less as it should be at the center of it. So if you can center, an azimuthal projection at your study area, then you can get more or less equal areas around the center. This is an example of how the different projection types distort the reality of the geometry. Here's the Mercator that we talked about in red. Here's the conic. And here's the geometric. And here's the center. So here at the center, they all line up really nice, right? So if we're talking about small areas, maybe the projection system doesn't matter that much because there's not going to be very much distortion at the center. <coughs> but as soon as we start to get 100, 200, 300 kilometers away from the center, we start to get some major distortions and this can really change our results. Everybody, please notice that that pink circle in the middle is Lawrence, Kansas. So that's, that's where I work, okay? <laughs> Did everybody get that noted? Yeah. So, when we're thinking about large areas, we need to consider the projection system that, that we're using. Uh-huh. Uh, so, So from what I'm picking is there's never been an accurate map produced. No, it's impossible. You cannot put a three-dimensional surface on a two-dimensional plane without distorting something, okay? What they can do is make the error really, really small so that it doesn't really matter much for the, answer, the questions that we have, okay? It means that there, there are different right answers for different studies. So what you may do in Botswana may be a very bad idea for somebody in Rwanda. You may use a different center point or you know, a different system. And also for one study you may need to preserve areas, another study you may need to preserve distances, and another you may want to use a very simple coordinate system like latitude and longitude. Right. And really the distortions matter the most when you're doing, you know, continental and global scale mapping. So that's when you notice them and that's when you have to decide, okay, do I want the equal area or the equidistant projection? But but if you're at the local scale, then um, there's a suite of projections that are known to minimize all distortion properties um, for your area. And so
so you just need to learn to pick the right one for your right area and, and like town and um, Ben said like you you'll have it, it's it's kind of easy once you know how they're made to just pick the right center like and then the right you know where are those parallels that w along which you have no distortion um, within that local area Thank you. So again, always try to ensure that your projection is appropriate for your area. Okay? Don't use a projection for North America if you're studying Africa. Okay? You're going to get some strange results. And when you go to publish, People may notice that and say, you know, what did you do here? How did you get this, these numbers? Okay. And also, and this is especially important when you're working with spatial data, verify your results. When you get your results, make sure they make sense. Okay. If you calculated an area of cropland for Rwanda that is bigger than the area of Rwanda, mm -hmm. then you know that probably you have a wrong projection system. Okay, and you can verify that. And it happens. I mean, when I went to publish my first ever first author paper, I was called out for this by the reviewers. And they, because I did a global analysis, and they said I didn't use the appropriate reference system. And I had to go back and redo everything. Okay? So, uh, people will notice. So, this is a, a view of QGIS, which we're going to get into later. And this is the interface that allows you to choose your coordinate reference system. Okay, this, I just did a quick search for Africa, and it came up with these different projection systems for Africa. Okay, so you have the Albers equal area. This is a, a popular equal area projection for a conic projection for Africa. Here's an equidistant conic. So if you're interested in distances, you could use this. If you're interested in areas, you could use this. Okay, and then these really complicated ones called sinusoidals, which honestly I can't even explain. Okay, they're, they're kind of difficult algorithms uh, that are involved. But uh, in any case, as Amelie said, if, if you're only working in a small area, any one of these would probably be okay. They're going to minimize the distortion within your area. Okay. Except your conformal. Except the conformal. Okay, and why is that, Amelie? Conformal projections, they conserve shape. Okay. Um, but at the expense of area. So, so there's, four, there's four projection distortions. Um, you, you either distort area or you distort shape. Um, and those two are, how do you say, um, exclusive like you have to pick one over the other you cannot have one projection at the and again this this matters at the regional and, and global scale you cannot have one projection that that um, keeps area correct and shape correct and when I mean sh um, shape is if you were to look at that country on the globe and to look at it on a projection that preserved um, shape, they would look the same. They would match. They would match. But um, oftentimes for any kind of analyses we're doing, and in particular for land use land cover change analyses, you have to use an equal area. So basically those are the ones, I think you already said that, that you default to right. um, eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're making a map for visual purposes, that might be the only case where you would want to use a conformal. Because you don't want to show a version of the globe that looks really weird. You want to show, for display purposes, what everybody thinks the globe looks like, and or what it actually looks like from a 3D perspective. But that's not going to have equal areas. The areas are going to be distorted. So if you're actually doing analyses, you need to use one of the the coordinate systems that preserve area or distance. Okay? So, again, luckily we have QGIS 
to kind of help us with this because it says equal area or equidistant or conformal. So it kind of helps us in knowing which geometry it's preserving. Helps us choose which uh, coordinate reference system we should be using. Probably one of the most common ones is called the Universal Transverse Mercator, or UTM for short. And this is a system that puts zones of longitude around the world. So every gap of longitude has its UTM zone. Okay, for Tennessee, I know that it's zones 16 and 17. I know that because I've used it and I've memorized it. So I can just put a UTM zone 16 coordinate reference system and I know that my data is going to be more or less preserved. The geometry is going to be more or less preserved. In Africa, depending on where you are, you're going to want to use a particular zone. Now, some countries or some areas might span two zones and it gets a little complicated. Okay, so you, you might have to do part of the analysis in one zone and part of the analysis in another zone. All right? Or if you're at the border areas, it may not be that, uh, may not, the distortion may not be that bad. But once you get, if you're, you know, doing a measurement here and you're still using the zone 35, then you're going to have some distortion. And you're not going to have good consistency between your different locations. Okay? So, are we okay with coordinate reference systems. We understand kind of what they do and why we use them, right? Any questions before we move on? In the UTN zone, uh -huh. so the, um, you, see, well, you see the equator, so when you're picking them, the UTN zones are my go-to if I'm at the local scale. When you're using them, you have to make sh sure you know if you're north of the equator oh, or right. south of the equator because when you pick them in the system, it'll be like UTN 36 north, north. or 36 south. And if, it's south, if you're south of the equator, you pick the south one. If you're north, you pick the north one. Good point. Uh -huh. Thank you, Amelie. Yes? Another thing is you guys, if you essentially get out to some level of, of capability in GIS and spatial analysis, somebody will come to you and say, I've got these coordinate data, um, make me a map, or do this analysis. And you need to be, you essentially need to do an interrogation of the person who gives you this information that was a single coordinate reference system used, which is not always the case. Never. <laughs> and you know, so if somebody says, oh, those are UTM coordinates, well, you need to say UTM in which zone, because otherwise you'll get a massive amount of, of error introduced. So just remember, these are kind of local coordinate reference systems rather than global, and so you have the, you have the potential to make really big mistakes. When, so when, I, when students come to me with problems um, with their analyses or, or things like that, I would say eight times out of ten, the coordinate system or the choice of projection is the problem, or the mix of coordinate systems is the problem. But it takes a long time to master these, but um, once you have a couple go-to for your area, it just becomes more simple, and, and, and once you always know that the first step in your GIS analysis is to project everything to the same coordinate system and the proper one for your area, and that's what you do every single time, then you, um, you decrease the chances of having mistakes down the line. So it's, it's important to understand it, and if, if you don't, like I give an hour lecture to my students about this, um, and if you want that lecture, uh, we can stay after class one of these days. Um, and I can give you like, because there's one more part to this, which is the datum, um, which matters as well, especially if you're using GPS coordinates, and that um, that can cause um, uh, offsets. So so yeah, if if you use GPS coordinates often, 
and you want to know more about coordinate systems, um, just come to me and as a small group or something, I can give you the one hour lecture about them. It's boring, but it's important. <laughs> or if a bunch of people want it, we'll just Yeah, we we'll can make tag room. it somewhere. We, we've got some space in the schedule. And so. I have it ready to go any day, really. Okay. So you, you can let us know. You guys let Amelie know if you want that. But if more than five or six people want it, we'll do it for the whole group. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, so we can just okay. add it. We'll find an hour. Yeah. Good. So later today, when we're going through the, the exercise, we're going to point all these things out and we're going to come across some errors. And you know, you guys are going to see what happens when we don't have the correct coordinate reference systems. Um, but that's a good point. The, uh, sometimes the, the program will let you know. It'll tell you these coordinate reference systems don't match. And either it won't let you do it or it'll give you a warning. And it'll let you know. Okay, other times you'll get very strange results and or you, it just won't even do anything. And as Amelie said, nine times out of 10, it's because the wrong reference system is being used. So if you get errors, that's almost always the first thing you wanna check. What reference system am I, am I in? Uh, yeah, we had one question here first. Well, I'm glad I can learn this and try to understand what is happening in the uh, CRS and other things. What, what gives me a headache is the EPSG. How is this related to the EPSG? So the EPSG is just a code that makes it shorter to know which reference system you're in. So instead of having to say that Africa equal area Lambert conformal, you just say EPSG 3789. And that's, that's the sp the one code that identifies that reference system. Okay, so I know that the WGS84 longitude latitude is EPSG 4326. I know that because it's the, one of the most common ones and I use it all the time. So a lot of times I can just enter 4326 and the computer knows exactly what I'm talking about. And I don't have to type in WGS84 latitude zero, longitude zero and you know, all the description of the reference system. Does that make sense? So do we, can we have a list of those that are applied in this context? Sure, yeah, I think we could do that. Yeah, there's a lot, but yeah, we can do that. We'll, we'll go over it when we look at QGIS. Thank you. We had another question here. My question is, okay, my question is we got with those who collect data using cameras or, or phones, and they bring this to you for making some maps. So I just want to know, how am I going to know the righteous reference system to choose to make my map? That's a good point. So the question was, someone brings uh, a photo to him, and the photo has GPS coordinates. How does he know what reference system he's in. Usually, if it's longitude and latitude, it's in 4326. But it may not be. It may be in another one. And it should say somewhere in that file which reference system was used. Or if you ask which camera you took it with, then you can maybe find out which reference system it was in. There's usually metadata, so data about data that are stored with that. And within, it'll say, oh, well, if it's lat lawn, it's, uh, it's always a geographic coordinate system. The problem is the datum. And so then you have to figure out what, and so typically, if you really don't know, you can make the guess that they're using the WGS, the World Geodetic um, Survey, thank you, of, of 1984. But not always, but that's, you know, most GPS units, at least, that's the default. And so my guess would be most thumbs, that would be the default as well. But that but information is in it the... It should be in the metadata. Yeah. So you have to, there are a couple programs that will show you the metadata that are embedded in the image. But they're there. You just don't see them very easily. And we'll, I'll, I'll show the metadata as well. So we'll go over that later. But this brings up another good point. Someone brings you a photo, 
with GPS. How accurate do you think the GPS is on your phone? Anybody? A guess. What is the what is the error do you think that is on a an iPhone GPS? Thirty meters. Anybody else? Sure, it depends. If you're in a forest, maybe a kilometer. And some phones don't have GPS. Some phones are actually using triangulation from cell towers. Um, so. Right. And it, the accuracies depend on the density of the towers. Yeah. So. So in most cases, if it's from a phone, the difference between WGS84 and NAD83, the two primary geographic latitude longitude systems, it doesn't even matter. Because the error of the phone is so big that that is the biggest error that you need to worry about. Okay? So that's another interesting thing to consider. And so these errors, these questions of scale, when we're talking about GIS, they have to always be on your mind. What are the errors involved with all of the different data sets that I'm using? And that goes into the confidence that we have in the results. Okay, so we go through this really complicated process and we have maybe this thin difference between a conservation area and an agroecosystem. And it's significant, but it's, but it's very close. Given the error in all of the different processes of the, the GIS analysis, do we still think that that difference exists? Maybe so, maybe not, okay? So we need to always kind of be thinking about that. Okay, so now we'll move into kind of how layers are assembled, the different types of layers, and the ways that we view data within the computer system. Okay, so typically in GIS, we're looking at multiple layers. Okay, we have one data set here, we have another data set here, and they all have coordinates that overlap. So we can see how the different data sets align spatially. And then we can do analyses based upon those alignments. All right, so we have the real world, and then we have these different representations of the real world in different layers. Okay, and the typically, or really always, the two different major layer types that we have are called raster data and vector data. So we can look, for instance, where are we here? Anybody? Where is this in the world? Rwanda. Good. Of course the Rwandans know that. <laughs> Maybe when we look at the border, we get a little bit more of a clue. Okay, so here's the border. We can add cities. Here's Kigali. Goma. We add roads. Okay, so we're adding these layers and we're looking at how all of these layers line up on the earth. Each one of them is a different data set. Rivers. And land cover. All of them can be viewed together. And we can use all of these different layers in an infinite number of ways to tell us about the relationships between each, each one of them and all of them. So using these layers, I could tell you, do an analysis in QGIS and say, how much of the length of Rwandan rivers goes over cropland versus urban area versus forest? What is the distribution of land covers for the rivers of Rwanda using just these two layers that I have here? Okay. So this is the real power of geographic information systems and land cover and land use. Okay, we're able to spatially relate all of these different data sets. So, back to the two major types of data. Rasters. Rasters are basically, you can think of them as a photo. A photo is comprised of pixels arranged in a grid. Pixels or cells. In a photo, each cell is a color. When you look at one cell, 
it doesn't tell you much. But when you zoom out and you look at all the cells together, you see the photo. Each one has a different color and all together they make an image. That's a photo. And that's basically what a raster is, except a raster doesn't have to represent visual, uh, visual light. It can represent a lot of different things. And I'll show you the different types of data that raster can represent. And then we also have, if we look at the same plot of land in vector format, it's in systems of lines in this case. So we've basically taken this river, which was a bunch of little cells that are colored blue, and we've outlined it with a line. So it's the same information in two different formats. One is a raster and one is a vector. Raster, again, a grid of pixels representing an infinite number of different values. It can be continuous values, so 1.5, 2.5, 3.7, 8.6 infinite number of values if we're representing maybe temperature or it can be categorical in this case what do we have what type of data continuous or categorical do we have an infinite number of values like 1.2 2.6 no we have a very limited set of values we have m r h c t and f and that's it Nothing in between. So this is called categorical raster data because it's a category. Each value represents one of the possible categories. In this case, we have the real world. H represents house. M represents mountain. R represents? F represents? Good. So we've taken this real world and we've abstracted it into this two-dimensional representation of a bunch of different grid cells. I can calculate the area of forest. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven cells. I have to know the area of each cell in order to put that in kilometers squared. But even Relatively, I can say, is there more forest or more mountain in this landscape? More mountain. Okay. There's many more numbers of cells and mountains than there are forests. This is a raster. Okay, this is the representation that we get from rasters. Rasters can represent lots of different types of information, as I said. So, a photo is the original yes one a question yeah go ahead can you so i'd like to know is it, is it, you say that uh, with raster we can calculate the surface even forest or mountain so yes there is a universal unite of us. No. It depends on the coordinate reference system that we're using. Um. Some reference systems have units of meters. Some reference systems have units of feet or inches. Yeah. Most of them have meters because that makes the most sense. <laughs> but you never know. Okay. okay? And each, when we look at the metadata, as Amalie was saying earlier, it'll tell you what the unit of the data set is. Okay, okay. Well, we're gonna do this later. Okay. okay, so the question was, we know how many squares there are, but how do we know what the units of those squares are? And the answer to that is you have to look to the metadata of the data set. It always comes with the metadata. If a data set does not have metadata, it's almost useless because it's almost just like a photo without any way of actually telling us information about the units or the reference system of that photo. Okay? Rasters are photos with metadata because they tell us so much more about what each pixel value actually represents. Okay? 
Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll explore it later in the exercise, okay? So this is a raster. It's a photo. It's a visual image of the Earth. This is the same patch of Earth, but it's categorical. So you have river, you have cropland, you have forest, you have maybe a village. Okay, this is a categorical raster. Here we can represent it as estimated rainfall. How many millimeters per year in this part of Africa? This is a raster. Here we have population density. Okay, and people, 1,000 people per square kilometer. This is one of the most common ways of representing global data in rasters. And the reason for that is because the data is very well organized in a grid and it makes it easy to do these simple arithmetic calculations. Okay, you have this number of columns, this number of cells. We can use simple arithmetic to make calculations of each one of those cells. So that's raster. One of the most important components of rasters is the resolution. As I said earlier, the resolution explains the size of the cell. Is it a big cell or is it a small cell? And it's kind of confusing because we say high resolution is a very small cell. Low resolution is a very big cell. Okay, so if we're doing an analysis, what would be the ideal resolution, high or low? High, right, because that gives us more detail. That's a smaller cell. Each cell represents a meter. That means every meter we get a new value. So we get a lot of details between a small patch of land. Right? This is the same raster of Rwanda in different resolutions. The resolution of this is 30 meters. Each cell has a width and a length and a height of about 30 meters. Or 0 .009 square kilometers within each cell. There's 42 million cells here. Okay? Here, we've decreased the resolution by 10. Decreased the resolution, but increased the size of the cell. Okay? What does that do to the area? It squares it. Right? Because we take length times width. So you square the difference. So here, we've multiplied by 10. Oops. Here we've multiplied by 10. Here we've multiplied by 100. 100 okay? And we keep going. So clearly, if we're talking about Rwanda, we would want the highest resolution possible because it gives us the most detailed information. Now, what do you think is the biggest problem with high resolution? Getting raster files in those resolutions. So getting the actual raw data in that resolution, yeah. That means you have to have very sensitive sensors in order to pick out that detail. That's a good one. I was thinking more about actually for us, when we're trying to analyze the data, this is the same area. But when we're analyzing this data, we have to analyze 42 million cells. Whereas here, we only have to <laughs> analyze 42. So the computer obviously can do that, but it's going to take longer for the computer to do that. Okay, and you can see that here. Right, the image resolution, the smaller the cell, the larger the image size. So even though computers can be really good and really fast, 42 million values is a lot of values. And it can take a long time to compute the different, inf the different analyses that we need to do. So resolution is often a crucial, crucial question that we have and the right resolution is going to depend on two main things. One, how big is your study area? And what are, what are the 
questions that you have. Is a high resolution really necessary for the question that you have? And two, can your computer actually handle the resolution? If your computer can't handle the resolution, then you can't use that resolution and you need to find a lower resolution or make one. Okay, because as we'll see, it might become just way too long to do the analysis that we want to do. And so we need to convert to a lower resolution and do the analysis at that resolution. Okay, so these are, uh, this is one of the questions, primary questions that we need to think about when we're looking at raster uh, data. Vectors. This is the other primary type of data. This is the same parcel of Earth. Here we're representing it with vectors. So instead of cells, we have points. And each point is connected with a line. So in this case, we need a data for each point. And the computer knows how to connect the dots to draw the outline. Okay, here it's a little bit more difficult for us to tell which is more. I mean, we can visually see but we can't count it by hand. We'd have to take a ruler and measure each length and do the calculations, right? Whereas in the raster, we could get that, that area calculation really quickly, okay? But this gives us more detail because each point changes the outline a little bit. So we can put an infinite number of points and we can actually outline exactly the outline of the forest or the outline of the river. Whereas with the raster, 